Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. We have participants from across the US and Europe with us today. Welcome to Accessibility and New Normal Talks, sponsored by Access Smithsonian, the Theater Development Fund, and the Institute for Human-Centered Design. And of course, special thanks go to Beth Seabarth, Betty Siegel, Lisa, Lisa Carling, Larissa Kaninsky, Christine Trevigno and Valerie Fet Fletcher for all your work and support of this terrific series. My name is Jan Majewski. I head up the Inclusive Cultural and Educational Programs at IHCD. Our tech and video guru, Patrick Moynihan and Anupa Sundar, Anupa, I stop every time, I apologize. Sundarajan. <laughs> and I can also just go by Anupa either so. <laughs> I don't know why I do that. I apologize. Sundaraja, who is also, she is IHCD's tech guru, and I will manage the logistic side of the conversations and we'll call on people to keep the conversation running. Beth Seabarth, who is the director of the Access Smithsonian office, will be the moderator. We have four extraordinary speakers to frame and launch the conversation today. Ray Bloomer of the National Center on Accessibility, Nefertiti Matos from the New York Public Library, Nora Nagel from the Museum of Science Boston, and Alana Super, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Manchester in the UK, and she her area is biomaterials. Before we turn the session over to Beth Seabarth, here's a real short review of the session's rules of the road. Uh, captioning is available. To make it visible, click the CC button at the bottom of the screen. To change the size of the captions, click CC again and select the settings. If you registered for the session with only a first name, we would really appreciate it if you would change your on-screen name to your first and last name. So there are, you know, in case there are three Sarahs, we can specifically identify one person. You can comment or ask a question by putting it into chat raising your virtual hand on your Zoom screen or raising your physical hand on screen. Or if you're using a phone without video, please just identify yourself and say something like, I have a comment and we'll call you when you're next in line. We all ask that all participants stay muted until they're called because we're trying to make this conversation as accessible as possible. So if everyone is muted until called, people will know who is talking and speech and captioning will be clear. Please introduce yourself with your name only when it's your turn to talk. We're recording the session and maintaining the transcript. So when we post it on IHCD's website, the speaker's identities will be clear for future viewers and readers. The chat at the bottom of the screen can also be used to post resource links, to have crosstalk with other participants in the session about issues under discussion, and to offer new topics for additional sessions. And finally, we're going to try to include as many people as possible within the time allowed. If you have a question that's not answered, please include it into the chat and we'll try to get a response for you later. We're really looking forward to starting this vital conversation. And with that, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Beth. Thank you, Jan. Um, I'm Beth Zebarth from Access Smithsonian. And I'm really happy to um, be part of this series on um, the things that we are now facing in the new normal and how we can better address accessibility um, for people with disabilities during um, our planning for reopening and the new normal. And so I think that we have some, um, you know, some hot topics that we have been talking about and tactile access is certainly one of the ones that I'm particularly concerned about. I don't want to see us go back to um, visitors only being able to come into a museum and having objects behind glass and, um, and we have lost everything that we have fought for for so many years. Um, so we have gathered together some great people to talk about um, how we can make sure that we still provide effective communication for people who are blind or have low vision and people with brain-based disabilities and anybody else who benefits from a tactile experience um, in terms of their learning. 
And so I'm going to start off with having Ray Bloomer talk about um, a law and effective communication. Well, thank you, Beth. I appreciate it. And thank everyone for joining us today. As we're moving forward, uh, both uh, through and out of the pandemic, and we're talking about the uh, uh, concept of new normal, in my mind, I think new normal means that there's nothing going to be too normal. I don't think it, it's going to be any one thing. It's going to be dynamic. It's going to be pliable. And it's going to be in constant flux. One thing about what is currently going on is the fact that we're always learning new things about it. And uh, we're going to have to make adjustments as we go forward with the, that new knowledge that is constantly occurring. I just want to remind everybody that when it comes to people with disabilities, uh, number one, there is a legal requirement under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. There is a legal requirement under Titles 2 and 3 of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And under those acts, uh, those two pieces of legislation, civil rights has not been uh, removed, suspended, or in any way changed as a result of COVID-19. The Department of Justice and other federal departments and agencies have put out documents that uh, help to uh, remind people of that. Beth talked about those of us that have been involved in fighting the good fight for many years to get us to the point where we are as accessible as we are today. And it's pretty obvious that people with disabilities have been the last ones in. And now that COVID-19 is there, it appears that uh, with all the discussion that's going on about uh, what to do with tactile objects and interactives, people with disabilities uh, are being considered to be the first ones out last ones in and the first ones out. And that's something that we've got to make sure doesn't occur. It means that we've got to change our thinking or maintain the thinking that we've had all these, uh, uh, over all these years. As we look at what are the safety effects, the health effects that we need to go through as we're examining uh, the changes that have to take place. We have to think of things in their totality, not just focusing on tactile objects and how do we how do we deal with those, but look at it in terms of, and this is where I personally feel very frustrated, is that you have to get into a museum. You've got to touch a doorknob or a door handle to do that. Once you're in, you go through in some museums security. You have to put your hands on handrails, elevator buttons. When you go into a restroom, the stall doors aren't closing on their own. You've got to touch something. Constant touching no matter where you go. And yet the first focus that people have is we've got to deal with these tactile issues. It's not a matter of taking them away. It's a matter of how do we make sure that we do them, utilize them, maintain them in a safe way. And that's some of the things that... Uh, uh, we'll, we will be discussing today. We're also looking at things like gift shops and cafes. How are we going to deal with all of those issues without touching them or being able to touch them, but again, doing it in a safe way? I think that's the most important thing is that we do keep, keep in mind COVID-19 will be temporary. A vaccine is probable and we're constantly learning about the effects of it, what are the most dangerous aspects of it. And when I say constantly, it's almost every day when you put the news on, you're seeing something different. We need to make sure that the decisions that we make now need to be looked at in the exact same vein. Some decisions that we make right now have to be temporary decisions, temporary adjustments, and not come up with permanent things that are going to affect people's um, experiences in a museum 
uh, where it does bring about some type of permanent negative impact. Right now, we need to make sure that we're considering the future with anything that we do in a way that maintains accessibility. Jan mentioned earlier, effective communication. That is a key component of exhibit accessibility. We've got to make sure that if we have to come up with a temporary change in some way to maintain health or safety, that it does not diminish accessibility. We must make sure that we provide an effective alternative to whatever it is that may be temporarily suspended or removed, but not on a permanent basis. The experience still has to be there. We have to be able to provide a, the same level of accessibility at all times. We can't just take things away because we're under a pandemic. So I think it's really important that we think of what is it that we're communicating? What are the issues that we have to um, uh, change in order to make things safe and then come up with a method that will provide an equally effective alternative? And it has to be done in a, um, a comprehensive manner. We have to look at what are all the, all the benefits that we had before we decide that we need to take something away. But I also think one of the most important things for us to keep in mind is along with what we're learning about as far as the coronavirus itself goes, we're also learning all types of ways to combat this virus and combat it in terms of how do we clean it? How do we clean objects? And we'll talk a little bit about that later on so that we can utilize and maintain interactives, tactile experiences without removing them. I think that is the most important thing is that we don't make permanent immediate decisions based on limited information that we have right now. Keep in mind, we are constantly learning about this virus and its effects, but we also want people to come into a museum and feel comfortable to know that it's safe and that museum administrators and planners are looking at the safety while at the same time looking at that same equal robust experience. And we want to make sure that that is done in an inclusive manner. Adjustments will have to be made. Those adjustments have to be made in ways that are inclusive. And we've got to make sure that we also don't make long-term permanent decisions for something that has a temporary effect. And it is my hope, and I know it's the hope of everyone, that this is short-term, and I do mean short-term, until we either have a virus, I mean, I have a, uh, a vaccine available, or the combination of a vaccine along with ways that are relatively easy to be able to maintain constant safety over tactile type of objects and interactives. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ray. I think that um, you brought up some really important points that there is kind of the COVID era strategies and then the um, vaccine era strategies that we need to really be thinking about. I'm gonna turn it over now to Nefertiti to talk about, um, about her experience with um, tactiles and museums and the importance of them. Thank you, Beth. I just wanna confirm, can I be heard? Yes. Oh, good, my, my microphone choice changed <laughs> for some reason. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. This is very important conversation and I'm privileged enough to be on this panel to sort of lend the personal touch as a blind museum goer. So here we go. Um, I thought I would start by letting you know that I am a first generation American. Mm -hmm. My parents are both from the Dominican Republic from very, very humble means. And they did not grow up 
with a, an, an understanding or an appreciation for culture outside of, you know, the food they ate, the music they listened to and danced to, the language, etc. cetera. Um, they come to this country in the early 80s and they try as many immigrants do to do the best they can, you know, move, move up in the world, have a better world for their children than they found themselves in growing up. It's a beautiful idea, it's a hard life, but I arrive and I am okay for a while. And then I was found to have a brain tumor, which severely affected my optic nerve. Boom, 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 I can't see very well. They thought for a time I couldn't see at all. And starts things like, you know, where are we gonna send her to school? Is a school for the blind best for her? Should she be mainstream? Things of that sort. And many decisions that, you know, were out of my control, of course, being a child, but that would have some lasting effect on me later on. For example, this lack of appreciation for such places like museums. I remember when I was about, was it, I don't know, it was 12 or 13, there was a museum outing, I think, to the Museum of Modern Art, if I remember correctly. And you know how you have to bring home permission slip and have your parents sign it. I remember my dad saying in Spanish, like, why would you want to go there? Uh, you know, why, why do I have to pay X amount of money to send you there when everything there is to be seen, right? basically saying, you can't see, what the hell are you going to do in a museum setting, right? And I was like, but they said we could touch things and, you know, they, they're going to describe things in my own little child way, getting sort of upset because everyone else was going, everybody else was getting, you know, an opportunity to attend, whether they could see or not. And I didn't want to be the only one who couldn't. And so he was like, well you know, we can get all this in books at a library for free. And yay, I work for a library now. But <laughs> at the time, I just wanted to join in with the rest of the kids. So finally, okay, he paid however much it was. He signed the permission slip. My mom was like, I want to go as a chaperone. That was allowed. And I had a wonderful time. And it sort of woke up this, this feeling in me of like, I do belong here. Why can't I come to a place where things are, are for people to see just because I can't? I can hear, I can feel. And it sort of woke up this like, maybe rebellion? I don't know, maybe that's too dramatic. But I made it my business to like go to every theater play, go to every museum outing I possibly could you know, go to every like dance thing my sister was at or was performing in. And this feeling of like, you may think I don't belong, but I'm just as human as you, I belong. So a little bit of a, of a advocate from a very young age, a little bit of like a rebellion thing. I remember having other fights with my dad about cost for things where you're just gonna go sit there and have people talk at you, or you're just gonna go there and you can't really see things for yourself and all this. And again, just feeling like this is important. It's not just about school, daddy. It's not just about getting a good job. You know, I understand those things are important too, but so is knowing your history. So is having access to sculpture and, you know, music, theater, everything was important. He was all about you get your education, you get a good job so you can have the house, you can have the kids. And, you know, very sort of if, you know, the way I think of it, my opinion, a very sort of immigrant kind of way of thinking. We focus on the job, we focus on the money, then you can get things and have a better life for having those things. But I always felt like, yes, that's important. It's also kind of empty after a while. And I wanted to fulfill those missing areas in my life. And so, um, yeah, I can't imagine my life without those formative experiences in those museums and theaters, et cetera. I hate to think that 
you know, in this time of great uncertainty and, and, you know, thinking about will this change or anything like that, like Ray was saying that things would be removed or put aside, never to be back, uh, picked back up again in quite the same way, or if they're picked back up again, starting from like zero, I, I don't want to have a life like that. You know, in my own way, I never fought like legal battles or legislation or what have you, but I feel like in my own way, and other blind friends, people, other friends with disabilities, et cetera, we've been fighting our own good fight just by showing up and be like, being like, we belong here too. This is a place for us as well. Even just letting ourselves be seen in these places that the average person may not even have ever had it occurred to them. Like, oh yeah. A blind person can enjoy this painting. You have to tell them what it is, you know, explain to them what's being, what's being seen, interpret for them, fine. But they're here, they're, they're in the experience, they're surrounded by the same people. And again, to me, so important, being seen. Just being there can say so, so much. So echoing what Ray has said, it's really important that we don't forget that we don't put things aside, that we don't drop the ball. We've come too far, we've worked too hard. And, you know, for just a, an average museum goer that happens to have a disability, like those, those civil rights, that access to, to the way we see the world, the way we navigate the world, which is so heavily based on touch, that, that cannot be forgotten. We have to find ways around keeping that alive, keeping that available and making it even better. Thank you. Thank you, Nefertiti. That was really, really important to hear. And I really appreciate your personal, sharing that personal perspective. Um, so yeah, we really need to be thinking about how we preserve the human right to access our culture. And so, look forward to talking more about that. Um, Nora, um, you are a fellow museum colleague and love to have you um, talk more about museum access. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse my voice, I have horrible seasonal allergies. Um, so my name is Nora Nagel. I'm the ADA and 504 Accessibility Coordinator of the Museum of Science in Boston also legally blind guide dog user. Um, some of you may have met Larry the guide dog. Um, so the Museum of Science has had a long, long commitment to access, actually predating the ADA. And in the conversations that you know were hypothetical to begin with and eventually became more practical, when we were talking about reopening, um, there definitely was pressure from various sources and areas to remove all tactile objects from museums. And we decided as an organization not to do that. Um, the Museum of Science is lucky and that we're located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We have a lot of ties to the science community, to the local universities, through our board, through our staff. And in consulting with people involved in public health over the course of the last couple of months, it's become clearer that transfer in tactile ways by a fomite or whatever it's called um, is less likely than, it's, it's less of a risk than inhaling aerosolized droplets that may contain the virus. So in thinking about how to open knowing that, um, you know, we realized people with disabilities and not just people who are blind, but other people really need tactile objects. They, if you can't have a, a museum set up for just people who are visual learners, some people are real hands-on learners and that's how they learn to put things together. And we realized for some visitors, Tactile objects are a necessity. For others, they're an option. For others, they're a supplement or an, an added benefit. But there are so many people who benefit from them that we wanted to make sure that that option always existed. 
So after talking to public health officials, um, we came to some conclusions. We're definitely keeping tactile objects. Um, one of the first things on our website when you try to buy tickets going forward after we open, there's going to be a visitor code of conduct and that is going to address what we expect from visitors as far as their behavior, whether it's mask wearing or whatever. But it's also going to spell out very carefully what the museum is proactively doing to clean surfaces, to screen staff people, to keep visitors safe. So it's you know not only what we expect of you, but what we are doing for you so that you understand. Um, there are some things that we are removing. Um, you know, I mentioned aerosolized droplets and the what seems to be a real increased risk of being in confined spaces that aren't necessarily well ventilated with another person. So we're removing anything that's a crawl through or a small enclosed space. So if you've ever been to the Museum of Science, we have an Apollo capsule. That's going to be closed. But we're also trying to make it fun. We're trying to figure out some fun thing to put inside of it to, to sort of keep whimsy alive and to make things fun as opposed to just do not enter signs all over the place. Um, we're keeping our touch screens um, and the touch screens that we have are accessible. They have provide audio feedback. Um, we consulted with the manufacturers and we turns out we have um, touch screens manufactured by a number of different companies. And we talk to them in detail about what cleaning protocols they can withstand, what cleaning agents we can use on them, and they will also be regularly cleaned. We're also going to encourage the use of um, styluses if people want to bring their own. That's great. Unfortunately, most touch screens are what are called capacitive touch screens as opposed to pressure based. So uh, handing out styluses that can interact with the capacitive touch screen were. It was too expensive a proposition to hand one out to every visitor. Um, we're temporarily removing things that involve either lots of small things or that are very difficult to clean where you wouldn't be able to basically keep up with a, a sufficient cleaning regimen. Um, a good example of that would maybe be a children's area that had a tub of small Legos. Constantly, they have all sorts of nooks and crannies. They're very small. And if you're having to clean all of those Legos every two hours, um, that's really not practical. Um, the other things that we're, we would remove are things that, for whatever reason, their material is not compatible with cleaning um, regularly. And we're thinking of in those instances, maybe replacing them with 3D printed examples of the same thing. Um, we are also removing one of our more iconic accessibility features, which are our, um, what are called our earphones or our audio labels. And the reason behind that is that, um, well, let me first tell you what they are. Um, it used to be that the audio, that the content of any printed label on an exhibit or a component would be available in audio format read by a professional voice actor as opposed to a text-to-speech engine. Every component has a little handset like a phone and a one-inch square button on the front left corner. So once you know where they are, you could find them on your own if you were blind or if you had any sort of other print-based disability you couldn't read. Um, or chose not to. But because those are components that are picked up, handled, and then held right to the face, right by the nose, right by the mouth, we came to the conclusion that they would not be safe to keep in use. But it was very important to not deviate below the standard of accessibility that we had been providing in the past. So uh, while the museum was closed, we consulted with a service called IRA, which I know is in use at the Smithsonian. It's a smartphone based service where a blind or low vision or really any user can call into the service and using the front facing camera on your phone, 
the agent on the other end looks through the front facing camera and can describe what's going on, can read printed material to you. Um, and we had thought about providing that service in the past and we didn't do it, but we realize in this instance, we do not want to deviate below the standard of accessibility that we had been providing in the past. Um, we are also creating an app to replace that audio label system. And we had been working on that prior to all of this, but that's not going to be ready in time. So we want to make sure that we provide something in the interim. Um, we are handing out, we're continuing to hand out things like our assistive listening devices with um, additional cleaning protocols. Same thing with wheelchairs and scooters, the accessible amenities that we'd had available in the past are still gonna be available. Um, we are removing, um, another thing that we're removing are components that involve a lot of blowing air um, we were actually talking before the call about things like hand dryers in restrooms. One of the things that we've heard from public health officials is that a strong fan can just blow virus everywhere. So anything with uncontained airflow is being taken off the floor. We're installing hand sanitizer stations. And we also saw it as an opportunity, particularly around tactiles, to educate the public. And one of our exhibit content um, uh, creators came up with this great slogan that I really love, which is, it's not what you touch. I mean, you cannot catch this virus through your skin. It's not, so the message to the visitor is around that, that it's something that you're inhaling, that it gets in through your mucous membranes. It doesn't matter what you touch. What matters is what you touch next. And that's sort of the focus of the education. You can touch whatever you want. But before you touch your face or your eyes or your mouth, um, you wash your hands, you sanitize your hands. So we saw it as a good messaging and educational opportunity too with visitors. Um, we're still handing out things like paper maps because paper is pretty low risk. And when we weighed that risk in comparison with printing large maps and hanging them on the wall, handing out paper maps that were disposable seemed a lot safer than printing a wall directory where we'd have visitors standing shoulder to shoulder with one another, trying to figure out how to find their way around. Um, so that's, I think that's a lot of what we're doing. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I really, and I think other people have been using the science will tell you the same thing. We really feel strongly that tactiles don't need to disappear and access doesn't need to disappear. We can, we can work with this. We've had to work with a lot of other weird stuff over the years. You know, we'll figure it out. And the great thing about calls like this and <clears throat> organizations like LEAD is that we can help each other out and we can all figure this out together. Thank you, Nora. That was really helpful. I think that um, hearing um, how the strategies that you've come up with, the you know, the obvious um, care and thinking that has gone into this um, is really um, you know, commendable. And I also think that having a science museum, you know, promoting the message that you are um, is so key. Um, and we're going to go from that to Ilana, who is going to talk more about the science of um, antimicrobial um, finishes and um, research that's going on on how we can make tactiles more safe. Hi, I'm Alana. I just want to say thank you so, so much for inviting me. It's a really, really exciting platform for me as a scientist to kind of go into a world that I'm not entirely familiar with. Um, that there's obviously some, some impact through my mum uh, who worked at IHCD a, a few years ago. And so I look at things a little bit differently because of that, but really coming from the science background, this is such a massively complex um, area that it just has so many different facets. So being able to hear from all of the different speakers that are approaching 
from different areas as um, it's really, really fascinating. So my background um, initially is mechanical engineering. I've always been very, very interested in biomaterials and bioengineering. So uh, this field kind of introduces and incorporates biology and chemistry and physics and then puts it into a practical application within the medical field. Um, so my current research is on antiviral materials. Um, and in the past, I've done quite a lot of research on antibacterial materials. And so they kind of both fall under this, this uh, umbrella of antimicrobial materials. And it's a brilliantly exciting field and it's moving really, really quickly. And strangely enough, COVID has brought a lot of exposure and a lot of resources and a lot of focus on some of the really uh, intricate research that's going on. And it's really, really, um, it's wonderful to see that all of these tactile surfaces and things, we, we want to maintain them and we want to do everything that we possibly can to keep those functioning as they have been. Um, I can talk a little bit about some of the research that's going on at the moment. And um, I think a lot of what I am very comfortable talking about is kind of cleaning procedures. So I know, um, first of all, when you have a tactile material, you have the actual material that it's comprised of. So normally I'm guessing it's something plastic polymer based. Um, it's a material that can be cleaned. And so we're talking things like, okay, well, you can clean it with bleach. Uh, you can, which is a very, very harsh, but <laughs> it works for this application. You can clean it with things like alcohol, which is a little bit softer um, on your plastics. But if you're looking to create a self-cleaning material, there are also quite a lot of options. And I actually think it would be a, a, a really brilliant way to go. Um, there are things like you can impregnate materials with copper. So copper is an, antimicrobial in its nature. Um, there's also ways that you can attach little soap molecules to your surface. And in that way, any sort of bacteria or virus that comes in contact will, the membrane will be disrupted and it breaks apart and becomes non-effective. Um, I know there is a, a, as Nora mentioned earlier, there is a conversation about forced air and how that's really, really dangerous in, in this situation at the moment. And I agree, as a scientist, um, you look at fans and you look at hand dryers and you kind of not quite freak out, but you almost freak out because it, it's, a, it's a super spreader, it really is. Um, but in the same breath, there are ways that having forced air directed downwards will actually help those aerosolized particles reach the floor quicker. So you're looking at tiny droplet sizes from a cough, from a spray, and at the smallest particle sizes, so 0.5 microns, you're looking at 41 hours to kind of have those settle. So if you're able to force that convection and force that air downwards, it might bring that time limit down a little bit. So where you have these aerosolized particles actually reaching a floor. There's obviously so much research that needs to go into it. And also every space is different, but there's, there's a lot of different ways that um, some of these can be approached. And I think it's a brilliant, a brilliant opportunity to combine forces and really figure out uh, ways of combating this. And um, I, as Ray said, yes, this is, these are times that hopefully will be over really quickly. Um, but I think it's also quite important to remember that it might happen again. And it might not be COVID and it might be something completely different. But if we could find a way of maintaining all of these systems, 
but some long-term solution that might actually battle the microbe at its at its contact point, it would be a really, really powerful surface application and something that we wouldn't necessarily have to talk about so much in the future, because unfortunately, I think it might happen again. And I think for me, I'm, I'm happy to answer any sort of questions, um, but yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to say, so thank you. Thank you, Ilana. Um, that's really helpful to hear the science perspective on what might be safe and um, the kinds of research that's happening on the antimicrobial surfaces. And I'm going to take the um, take advantage of the privilege of being moderator here and just ask you um, quickly whether um, you talked about um, more porous kinds of surfaces like plastics. What about metal? Because we have a lot of metal in um, museums and is that where we just need to think about the, the cleaning strategies because we're not going to be able to impregnate metal with um, with materials that will be antimicrobial other than copper which you mentioned. So the other big one in my antimicrobial materials is silver but I have a feeling that silver plating everything in a museum not <laughs> quite not quite feasible um, but no so you're right um, metal is really, really easy to clean. And um, what's brilliant is you can, you can attack it with ethanols and things like that. But all of, the, all of the research that I'm seeing coming out of the field in, at this point in time are actually talking about surface coatings. So the hope is to not actually have to replace all of these things but you can put a layer of plastic that's impregnated with copper on top of an existing surface. Um, and I know when I say polymer, it, it, everyone thinks like a, a chunk of plastic, but it doesn't always have to be. It can be a very, very thin film. And I've seen so many calls and so many um, research opportunities for designing these thin films with the hopes of, well, it could be a, a screen protector. It could be... Um, something that's laid out and, and I mean, you have it on your phone or you have it on a touch screen. Um, another quick point to make is I know they did a lot of research in South Korea about this and I haven't so much seen it in other places or seen it picked up in other places. Um, but certain surfaces, metals especially, are very easily cleaned using UV radiation. And we're talking a, a UV LED light. Um, I have a figure here, which was 99.9% .9 sterilization within 30 seconds of UV LED irradiation. Um, and that's COVID. So, but I, I've used UV on a lot of different microbes and you can you can see it. I've taken the photos before and after UV irradiation down to five seconds, and you can see it breaking open these membranes. So on plastics, it does lead to some issues um, with the degradation of the plastics, but on metals, it's a it's a really good option, and I think especially nooks and crannies and hard to clean areas, it could be it could be something that could be easily implemented and pretty effective. Well, that's brilliant. I think that uh, I'm really pleased to hear about um, the different ways that we can, you know, effectively um, clean things. So, or, you know, have the hopes of having more antimicrobial um, surfaces that can be applied um, or impregnated into the materials. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. At this point, we're going to turn it over to questions. Jane? We have a question from Lauren Race. Lauren? Hi, Lauren, Lauren Race. Um, <laughs> happy to be here. I, the UV light um, recommendation answered my first question, but I actually have a second question, which is, what are your thoughts about shifting the focus um, to sterilizing visitors' hands versus the touch objects themselves? So... Um, Yes, 
brilliant. I think, yeah, I mean, in the UK, I, I was mentioning earlier, um, someone watches you before you enter a shop or, um, uh, yeah, generally shops and like supermarkets and things like that. They watch you sterilize your hands. They watch you, like I went into Ikea and they, they watched me and they said 20 seconds and went through the whole thing. And yes, I think it's brilliant. Um, but there's nothing stopping me from touching my face after that. Um, or say a little kid uh, starts coughing and I'm a mum and I'm going to cover their face, right? So in that act, you would need to re-sterilize your hands again. And I think we had a conversation earlier. Um, Nora mentioned, yeah, okay, same thing with going to the toilets. I would say, well, okay, you trust someone to wash their hands. But at this point, you can't trust anyone to wash their hands properly. And um, the point was made about these are the same people that you're arguing, having them wear masks. And the evidence for that is overwhelming, but you, you still can't trust them to wash their hands for 20 seconds. Um, I think another brilliant option could potentially be is having people wear gloves. Um, and so you, you sterilize your hands and you put on gloves. And this is something that I don't know if that interferes with being able to use um, or to read Braille or be able to use some of these tactile objects. I don't know if gloves interfere. Um, but personally, I know I've got a pair of gloves on in the lab. I'm not going anywhere near my face with that. Um, it's a little bit of a reminder. I use my elbows to open doors and things like that because I have these gloves on. Um, and also surfaces I touch, I then take off the gloves and they go into a bin. And then, okay, I, I wash my hands after that. So there is, I think there's opportunity for having the person sterilize themselves, but I don't think we can rely on it. This is for all the panelists in general. Um, you know, so the first question is, how long does the virus potentially stay in the air? And then also a question from Diane uh, nutting around um, suggested strat strategy for natural objects like stone, feathers, or fabric-based materials. I just wanted to jump in on the last question and just suggest that if you're talking about preparing your facility for visitors, I would say focus on controlling what you can control. And you can control how often your objects are cleaned. You can control what's on the floor. What I think we all know if we work in public uh, accommodations is you cannot control your visitors. You can never assume that just because somebody's wearing gloves, they're not then touching their face. You know, the, the average random person, I'm sure you've all seen people in grocery stores, you know, coughing on their latex gloves and then reaching for something on the shelves and then looking at it and putting it back. I mean, so I would say if, if you can get visitors to wear masks, great. If you can get them to wash their hands, great. But focus on what is within your practical sphere of influence. Otherwise, you're just going to be spinning your wheels and driving yourself crazy. Other questions? I think the, the question about things like feathers and fabrics, um, I mean, things like that, I, you know, I honestly don't know the ins and outs of cleaning them. Feathers, you know, we could replace with a 3D representation fabric. I don't think that fabric that there's as much of an issue with transfer on things like fabric, um, like cloth to cloth. But if you're concerned about cleaning objects like that, they may need to be temporarily removed or maybe they can be replaced with 3D representations, particularly something like a feather. I mean, you're not gonna feel what the actual feather looks like, but you're gonna get the shape, you're gonna get the, you know, at, at least a, a pretty significant impression of what it is. Beth, there's a question from Mariano. Oh, good. 
yeah, and the question was, is? Um, well, I was asking about, um, I have some 3D models to be printed that for a, <clears throat> a gallery I'm design, designing for the Smithsonian, <clears throat> pardon me. And, um, and if there's any recommendations and the kind of finish that we could do to that model. Um, apart from copper finishing, I don't think it would be. Aren't there some 3D filaments that have copper embedded in them? Yeah, so you you can do um, micro particles um, and that can be as a part of the filament, as Nora said. Absolutely. Um, it, it is impregnated before you even start 3D printing. And what's brilliant about that is although copper is fantastic, and yes, I saw another question about uh, copper alloy, so bronze, yes, not as many um, antimicrobial properties, but yes, still pretty good. Um, one issue is when that copper starts to oxidize and it then has a film on top of it, which is a protective barrier for the actual copper degrading. Um, mm. And without going too much into the science side, what you're relying on with these materials is tiny little charges leaving the surface. And basically it makes a very, very unstable surface for a bacteria or a virus to stick to and actually be able to sit on the surface. But once that copper then has a protective layer, so copper oxide, or when it rusts and things like that, um, that capability kind of gets reduced. Now, if you have something like a micro, micro particulate impregnated material, it doesn't tend to form or have the ability to form those protective layers. Also, a lot of people will treat copper because they like the bright, shiny copper color. But in doing that, you're losing that antimicrobial property of it. Um, but these, these melt spun uh, 3D printed materials that are impregnated with copper um, from the research that I've been reading have shown really, really good results over quite long periods of time. I'm not saying that it will last forever. Um, I think that's optimistic. Uh, I'm saying that it it is possible. And would you have a name of this material so I could actually research it and begin to um, spec it for my project? I can look it up and I can get back to you if I can okay. grab an email. Um, but yeah, that that's the other problem is uh, commercial capabilities are, are tricky. And I think some... Um, I, I know lots and lots of projects that have kind of stopped. So you get brilliant research and then it loses funding. Um, mm -hmm. So I can definitely get you on the right track. If I cannot find a specific company, I'm sure one of the authors of the paper would be able to tell you the, the progression of the project. And I came across that particular material in researching the possibility of 3D printing antimicrobial styluses which I'll save you the trouble, not really, didn't really work well, but um, okay. that's how I found out about that material. So I think if you just, if you Googled it, I mean, if you literally just Googled it, you'll find it. We're also putting together a collection of resources that will go on the ICD website when we post this video and it's transcript in the chat. So if anyone wants to put resources into the chat now or wants to send me the, any links to resources, that will be great. We'll post them all so that everyone will have access to them. There is a question on, whoops, and I've lost it now. There was a question online regarding gloves or a comment online from Rima saying um, that gloves are not a good idea. And I wondered, if anyone wanted to respond to that. I, you know, I agree with that for the same reason that I said before. I mean, gloves, only, gloves are only as good as the user of the gloves. 
And if you don't trust people to wash their hands and then behave appropriately, adding gloves isn't going to help. I mean, if somebody is wearing gloves and sneezing into their hand and touching things and blah, 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 you know, it, it's just another layer, you know, it yeah. really has more to do with behavior than anything else. And that's why we're trying to get across to people the idea that it's not what you touch. You can't contract the virus by touching anything. It doesn't travel through the skin. It's not what you touch. It's what you touch next. Okay. And before you touch your face, before you touch any mucous membrane, wash your hands or sanitize your hands. And it's an opportunity to educate people. But um, I think sometimes things like gloves give people a false sense of security maybe um, but if the behavior doesn't change the gloves aren't going to help Nefertiti can you talk a little bit about um, how gloves um, change your perception of, of things that you touch sure well I'll tell you um, I've been to several museum exhibits in particular where I was given these very thin, almost felt like that Reynolds wrap plastic stuff you use to cover things in the fridge, you know? Mm -hmm. Very thin kind of clings to the skin type material. And it, for me, did not make much of a difference. Um, but I, you know, it kept my skin oils and such from, from being left on the object, on the sculpture. If it was anything like, let's say, those purple latex gloves, that would start to impair my sense of touch. Um, and I'd like to think that I have very sensitive fingers and, and things and very perceptive, etc. But even the slightest change, personally, and other friends have agreed with me, other blind friends have agreed that it does alter sort of the input that we're getting, you know? Um, we can't feel, let's say something is very sort of, um, has a lot of nooks and crannies and such, or has a very sort of, I don't know, like a, a graded type of area, very, very finite lines, et cetera. We definitely run the risk of, unless we position our fingers such where we can run our fingernail on top of it and hear, you know, like the type of sensation, we might miss that. And that might be really important to the texture and the, and the tone and the message of the piece. So yeah, um, for all the reasons already said by Nora and Lana, um, or Alana, I'm sorry. Um, I agree, gloves are as good as the wearer of the gloves but also it can definitely have a difference or make a difference in the experience of the blind person. We are coming up on time here. So I think we're, what we will do at this point is I'll turn it over to Jan and she can kind of close out the session. Uh, there's a lot of good um, questions that are still in the chat that we're not going to get to now, um, but and we have talked about extending this series um, after the first four, and maybe this is a topic we can come back to again and talk more details. But you know, the the material that you all have given us um, today has just been so incredible and so helpful. Jan, thank you all very much. The speakers were fabulous. The questions were wonderful, and I think it was an extraordinary session that we hope to be able to continue. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care.